Hey, what's up, everybody? It's Joseph Ward, and welcome to my own The Shoulders of Giants YouTube channel. Thank you, thank you, thank you for joining me. Make sure you subscribe to this channel. Make sure you share this channel. And that notification button, click that notification button so every time I drop a new video, you will know what's going on. African history at your fingertips through this channel. You're getting biographies of your sung and unsung heroes right at your fingertips. So tell a friend to tell a friend to tell a friend to tell a friend about On the Shoulders of Giants. Well, you can learn about yourself and we tell our own stories. Peace out. Mary Prince. In 1788, Mary Prince was born to enslaved parents in Brackish Pond, which is now Devonshire Parish, Bermuda. Mary's father was owned by David Trimmingham and worked as a sawyer. Her mother was a house servant owned by Charles Miners. In 1788, Miners died, which caused Mary, along with her mother, brothers, and sisters, to be sold to Captain Darrell Williams. Captain Williams then gave Mary's mother as a gift to his wife, Sarah Williams, as a servant. Mary was gifted to Betsy Williams, the granddaughter of Captain Darrell. In 1798, Sarah Williams died. Captain Williams would meet a new woman and marry her two years later. To pay for the wedding, Captain Williams sold Mary to Captain John Ingham, separating her from her family. She was 12 years old, away from her family and facing constant abuse from the Ingham family. The Inghams constantly beat their slaves. Mary once witnessed her pregnant friend, Hetty, be beaten to death by the Inghams. She would grow tired of the beatings and escape the Ingham plantation seeking refuge with her mother. Mary's mother and other enslaved women helped Mary hide in a cave for several months before she returned to the Ingham plantation. The Inghams decided to sell Mary in 1805 to an enslaver known as Mr. D, who owned a salt pond in the Turks and Caicos Islands. Mr. D's workers were extracting salt from the salt ponds for up to 17 hours a day. The conditions of the salt ponds were inhumane and hazardous to the health of the workers. The men who worked the salt ponds were at risk of losing limbs because they were knee deep in salt water almost all day every day. Mary and the other women were charged with packaging the salt that was collected. The workers would die or become very ill often because of the working conditions. Mary developed rheumatism and St. Anthony's fire. Mr. D decided to give up salt mining and move to Bermuda with his family taking Mary along with them. Unfortunately, Mr. D was no different than the Inghams. He also abused Mary along with his daughter. Mary was forced to bathe Mr. D daily, which was some of the sexual abuse she suffered at his hands. Mr. D contracted Mary out to a place named Cedar Hill working as a clothes washer. The money Mary earned washing clothes, Mr. D collected. Mr. D sold Mary to John Adams Wood of Antigua for $300 in 1815. She once again worked as a servant while suffering from the effects of rheumatism. Often she would not work because of her declining physical condition. Wood traveled often. During his travels, Mary would take advantage of his absence and make money for herself washing clothes and selling food. She learned to read after joining the Moravian Church, which was something she feared the Woods would not approve of. She also married a man named Daniel James in 1826, a free black man who worked as a carpenter and cooper. Because Mary married a free black man, Wood abused her out of fear of her running away. The Wood family traveled to England in 1828. Geographically, Mary was free because slavery was abolished in the United Kingdom by the Slave Trade Act of 1807. Adams Wood unofficially freed Mary, but still retained the rights to her. He would tell her she could leave, but went out of his way to make sure she couldn't make a living. Eventually, she would escape the Woods' enslavement with the help of the Moravian Church in Hatton Garden, London. Contrary to what Wood believed or told Mary, she found work with the writer and abolitionist Thomas Pringle. She also joined the Anti-Slavery Society as their secretary. Mary's fight for her freedom was far from over. If she wanted to return to Antigua to live with her husband as a free woman, Wood needed to grant her freedom. Wood refused to grant her freedom. The Anti-Slavery Society would petition the Parliament for Mary's freedom, but was not successful. Several petitions and bills were proposed to end slavery in the West Indies, but at that time all were turned down. 
Pringle hired Mary to work for him in 1829 and also convinced her to have a story recorded by Susanna Strickland. The history of Mary Prince was officially published in 1831 and was the first time a book was published describing the life of an enslaved black woman in the United Kingdom. The book upset many of the people who supported and participated in the slave trade because it exposed the terrible conditions the slaves endured. Two human rights cases arose out of the controversy the books caused by exposing the true conditions of slavery. The Slavery Abolition Act was passed in 1833, which ended slavery but allowed slavers the time to transition the wealth they gained. The history of Mary Prince forced the people of the United Kingdom to view slavery through the eyes of an abused slave. Her book helped to push for the overall abolition of slavery within the West Indian Islands and other English territories. The book was so popular that it sold out three times and three different editions were published within its first year. Much is not known about Mary Prince's life following the years after her book was published, but her life story is one of many stories that we have that gives accurate accounts of the lives of slaves. Many people think that slavery outside the United States was less cruel, but stories like Mary's give us a different narrative. Mary used her experience to help others live a life free of enslavement. Miss Mary Prince, we proudly stand on your shoulders. And for more information, make sure you visit www.ontheshoulders1.com. To learn more about the On the Shoulders of Giants nonprofit organization, visit www.ontheshoulders.org.